the people of a city, a capital city called Nineveh of the then Assyria. Um, because it's our seventh part, um, I wouldn't go so much um, into recapping, but just to remind you from Jonah, the book of Jonah, prophet Jonah, four chapters, we've done chapter one and chapter two, and we're cha studying chapter three, and um, the story, its backdrop is such that God spoke into the heart of prophet Jonah and said to him that I am sending you to Nineveh. It's a big city, a great city, but its wickedness has arisen before me. So go and cry out against it. Cry out means prophesy, speak out against its evil, its evil nature, its actions, and everything about its evil worldview. And um, Jonah did arise, but he did not go to Nineveh. He went in a totally different direction, and he went on a journey that was five times longer than where he was sent to. He went to a port city called Tarshish. The way he got there was he took a ship from a place called Joppa, and he traveled. And what we read in the Bible was that because he felt he could run away from the presence of God, he paid this fare, found this ship, went into the, the, the darkest part of the ship, went into the farthest part, hid himself, thinking that the further away he went and the lower that he went, that God and God's voice and God's um, expectations of his life will be drowned out. And we've looked at our lives and we say that sometimes we are like that. We know that there is something we ought to do um, by law, by responsibility, by God's um, calling upon our life, by commission, by purpose, by vision. And sometimes we are afraid because we would have wished that those things are sweet. They will put us in the headline of every world's newspapers, national and local newspapers for good are not for bad. We wouldn't lose friends. We wouldn't lose face with anybody. We wouldn't be called Mrs. Killjoy, Mr. Killjoy, or bad, or that. We'll be celebrated by the whole world. But we all know that life is not like that. Life is a mixture of bitter and sweet. Some things start sweet, they tend to end bitter. Some things start bitter, we throw them out, but they tend to have sweet. It's like when we were young, that, that little sweet we used to call forohneh. You know, you start with it and you throw it out. And there are sweets like that too. You start, it's very bitter, and you throw it out. But if you just hold on and suck the sweet for about 40 seconds, then a great smile comes on your face. And those sweets are designed to see how far you can go with bitterness, with pain, with stress, with betrayal, and all that. And so that was Jonah's plan, that he figured out in his mind that this is the kind of God I'm dealing with, so let me go the other way. And that is not without precedent. In the Bible, there are many people like that. There are parables that Jesus Christ told about people who were given talents, five, two, one. And the ones who were given five made five more, got ten. The ones who were given two made two more, got four. And the ones who were given one came with all kinds of excuses that, you know, I couldn't do this. I knew you are a hard man. You expect so much. You are a perfectionist. You don't like problems. And people are like that all the time. They just make assumptions that God is like this, um, the powers that be are like that, the state is like this, the authority is like that, the board is like that, the CEO is like that, the principal is like that, the MD is like that, so let me do that. And sometimes in self-censoring and sometimes we find that we I like to put it this way. We say people's no for them without allowing them to say no. Sometimes we say people's yes for them without allowing them to say yes. We conclude ahead of time that this woman is going to say no. That man is going to say yes without having heard from them. Either because we have a perception, we have an erroneous malinformation about people, and sometimes we lose out. Because what you do not know by personal experience and fact, you cannot speak on personally speak about it maybe esoterically or like everybody knows about it you speak in generic terms but you cannot speak about anything specifically until you come into it if you've never delivered a child through the normal birth canal and channel as a woman you wouldn't know what it's like you can make a lot of noise you can shout at women in the labor world why are they shouting they should keep quiet but if you've walked through that path you will know what it's like and as a man or a woman sometimes you look at your own mother and you salute them.
because it dawns on you that there are five of you that she brought forth, six of you that she brought forth, seven of you, two sets of twins, or two, or even if you are the only child, you remember that this was pain. So there's nothing like personal experience than anticipating somebody's move, anticipating what people would do, because like in Job's case, you could be very, in Jonah's case, you could be wrong. And in the parable that Jesus Christ gave, in that parable, the parable ended this way. Take that which has been given to him and give it to somebody else. For to him that has, or to she that has, more will be given. And to the person who doesn't have the little that he has, and he sits on it, and he hoards it, and he blames everybody in the world for it, that little will be taken away from him. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ in the parable called that person wicked wicked was an evil person a slothful person because at most he could have said okay let me put it in the bank let it have some use we are all called into some amount of responsibility in life because all that we have that makes us the person we believe we are we got not by ourselves we got the breath from god we got education from parents teachers everybody has impacted upon our lives so we cannot just take in without giving back again in life so jonah tried to run away and he almost got a whole shipload of people into trouble he found out what the trouble was last week in our in our part six we talked about the brutal honesty i called it the brutal honesty of jonah he wasn't blaming anybody he wasn't going in circles he wasn't being religious he didn't have temporary amnesia suddenly memory loss selective memory he's forgotten the truth he said i am the cause of what's happening and if you can get me out of this situation, throw me out of this boat, everything will be fine. It was such a radical decision, but it was the truth. So he was thrown out of the boat reluctantly. The waters calmed. People's lives were saved. God had prepared a fish to swallow him. His life was saved. And at the end of the day, we find that after he prayed, from the belly of the fish in repentance, true confession of his sin, not just being remorseful because he was caught, but truly repentant, truly confessing to God and saying that where you send me, I will go. What you tell me to do, I will do, irrespective, regardless. People's faces, their looks, their personality, larger than life, it doesn't matter. The God that asks us to do something when we are sure, and for me, assurance comes by a personal relationship that you get through God by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. You come into purpose. You come into life's understanding and fulfillment. And ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter who says what. God that called you gives you the grace. That word means the enablement, the divine enablement, more than your academic power, more than your street wiseness, more than everything that you know, more than your educational background, your family power. It's the grace of God that helps you navigate through, and he preserves and he protects you. And whether it's sweet or sour, the good thing is that you walk out with your integrity intact because truth is truth. People may malign you, they may say many things about you, but at the end of the day, truth always comes out. So Jonah couldn't hide from God, but he confessed his sins from the belly of the fish three days, three nights, 72 hours thereabout. And God spoke to the fish to vomit him out. When he was vomited out, he came out on land. And as I ended last week, I said, when, when that happens to you, you know that God has given you a second chance. You've come literally from the dead. Nobody needs to tell you to go and do what is right. There is a parable the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about in the third gospel of the New Testament, the gospel from physician Luke. In the 15th chapter, I believe it is, from verse 10, a very popular story, we call it the prodigal son. And the Bible says that this boy one day woke up the younger of two brothers and just approached his father because, you know, the younger ones always tend to be bolder, you know, and just said, Father, divide to me your inheritance. I can't wait for you to die, for them to read the will. I can't wait for all this gazetting and all the thing that has to be done. I want my share now. And reluctantly, his father divided it to him and gave him. And the Bible says he went and he squandered it. Not because the inheritance was bad, but because he was not ready. He was not prepared. He hadn't understood the value of a hard-earned dollar C or dollar. He had no idea. He wanted money. He loved money. But his mind's processes were not yet mature to grasp the complex issues 
that have to deal with finances and how you can cut and join and do so many things to survive month after month. He thought if he wastes it all, something would happen. And he was not taking into consideration how the money was going. He was dipping in his pocket and there was money. And the Bible puts it this way.